Go ahead. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Yep. It's eight thirty. So anytime you want. Okay. Sounds good. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to twenty years of critical media literacy. Um, why it mattered then, and why it matters now. I'm your moderator and panel participant, Nolan Higdon. Uh, I'm joined by my co-conspirators from the Action Coalition for Media Education, ACME. And today, uh, we'll each take a few minutes to discuss 20 years of critical media literacy, why it mattered then, and why it matters now. Uh, once we have all completed our opening remarks, I'll turn to the chat to ask the panelists questions from all of you. Um, as a reminder, this is being recorded. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, turn your camera off. Um, if you're under 18, uh, we ask you to turn your camera off and, and conceal your identity. Um, I will introduce each participant by name uh, right before they give their remarks, and I'll post their longer bio in the chat uh, as they are speaking. And I do have one um, logistical request, which is um, I'm going to give remarks first. So if you have a question for uh, myself or any panelists, Please wait until I'm done speaking. That way I can ensure that I see it in the chats and, and can ask it to the panelists. I don't want to disrespect anyone by ignoring their question. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, get started. <clears throat> um, we've we've heard a um, we've heard a lot at this conference about um, the uh, differences or the distinction between um, critical media literacy and um, a critical media literacy. And as um, Allison, JD, and, and myself um, explained, there are distinct pedag pedagogical differences um, for each approach. And we as critical scholars contend that a, a critical framework is necessary to provide students with a comprehensive understanding of media. Um, indeed, that is why ACME was created. ACME was developed initially to ensure that there was an organization dedicated to critical media literacy in the United States. And at the time of ACME's creation, organizations such as NAMLI were, were willing to accept um, corporate funding to shape media education in the United States. And we as critical scholars worried that without an organization like ACME, um, corporate funding would work to marginalize or, or eradicate the use of critical frameworks in media literacy education. Um, this is because media corporations recognize that the critical frameworks operate as a direct challenge to corporate power. Um, indeed, as critical media scholars, uh, we apply critical frameworks to media content, asking students to consider the ways in which funding shapes uh, media messages. Uh, this was essential to, to my work and critical media literacy organizations such as Project Censored, um, both of whom focus on using critical media literacy to analyze uh, journalism and fake news. Paradoxically, many media scholars will question how funding shapes media messages, uh, but will stop short of asking how that very same funding shapes pedagogy. Um, unlike a critical media literacy educators, uh, critical scholars understand that it's essential to investigate how corporate funding um, shapes the learning process. And, and these debates, you know, date back to the 90s over issues um, like Channel One, for example. Although it's been a quarter of a century, um, the influence of media corporations on the classroom um, still matter today. Um, Allison Butler and myself, who you'll hear from in just a moment, we documented the ways in which big tech designs media literacy content to serve the interests um, of corporations in the classroom. Um, big tech educator content not only normalizes neoliberal ideology, um, but as Ben Williamson points out, it also transforms the classroom into a lucrative opportunity for big tech, big tech to collect and operationalize data. As the recent whistleblower revealed, um, Facebook, despite its uh, internal um, data revealing the harmful effects of its platforms on young people, continues to try to hook young people on their products at as young of an age as possible. And if it sounds familiar, it should. This, this reeks of big, big tobacco. Um, so 
I think why critical media literacy matters today is, is quite obvious. We see these patterns continue. Um, it is still a necessary approach for resisting the pernicious influence of powerful media corporations on the classroom. And thanks to the work of, of folks like Sophia Noble, we know that these big tech companies use their power um, to normalize white supremacist ideology and patriarchy. They are not indeed neutral. We also know that they use their platform to censor those who are fighting for social justice, such as Google's YouTube, which censored this very conference last year. And the recent revelations reveal that as media educators, we not only need to resist that influence, but question organizations such as NAMLI who do take corporate funding from big tech. If they know that these companies engage in censorship of conferences such as the Critical Media Literacy of the Americas, and that these corporations seek to hook young people on their products despite the documented harm they cause, how can organizations like NAMLI and Good Conscience platform Facebook or their conference or involve them in, in teacher training? And how can we in Good Conscience purchase admission to their annual conference, which costs you know, hundreds of dollars while we had a uh, free and virtual conference that attracted a thousand people, hashtag humble brag. Um, we, we know that um, taking this money helps normalize uh, much of the pernicious actors like Facebook and media literacy education. And because we raise the, these questions, um, because it engenders awareness and resistance to corporate power and oppressive ideologies, that is why critical media literacy still matters today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the president of ACME, which is Julie Frechette. Thank you so much, Nolan, I appreciate it. And I wanna start by welcoming everyone and offering a special thank you to Nolan and Allison, both of whom have been instrumental. They are board members of our Action Coalition for Media Education and worked really hard to put this conference together. So uh, special kudos and recognition to them. So um, just what I wanted to do is pick up where um, Nolan left off and, and talk about how um, when we were putting this panel together, I was thinking back to an, uh, a very important special issue of the Journal of Communication. And it focused at that time 20 years ago uh, or more on debates, um, uh, uh, debates within media literacy in the United States. And we had scholars, academics, and even activists that offered a range of perspectives on the need to educate students. Um, and this was well before Web 2.0. Um, we were talking more about mass media. And then what happened is you had uh, a bifurcation that started to form. So you had on the one hand, those who argued that media literacy should cultivate savvy consumers through textual analysis mainly. Um, and there wasn't enough of an emphasis on media reforms that would hold corporate media accountable for their power and their influence. And on the other hand, you saw scholars and activists who proposed teaching people to critically analyze the political economy of corporate media, but also to become engaged citizens as producers of media and to use their voices and perspectives to challenge mass media's dominance in society. Um, we can't, I, I don't think we can um, today in the time that we have afforded here uh, encapsulate all of the debates and what they were all about. But there were some important themes that emerged that are very relevant today. And many of us here were part of the formative years in the, in the field of media literacy education. And we turned to scholars, educators, and activists to help shape our thinking. What we analyzed then were the role of popular culture in the curriculum and debates over whether to remain uh, with textual analysis only or to engage in media production. This was a huge debate because media production was often um, relegated to tech schools and oftentimes higher education was not amenable to thinking about our role in getting engaged and involved with media. Um, you had Barry Duncan and his team in Canada who talked about popular media, bringing it into the curriculum in the classroom starting in high school. Um, in the UK, you had Len Masterman who, whose influential book teaching the media uh, emerged and he partnered of course with folks from the British Film Institute. And they were very much connected to teaching about and with media and letting students come to their own interpretations and analysis through critical approaches. And they borrowed from Frere, they also borrowed from Augusto Boal and thinking about the theater of the oppressed and ways to get engaged in culture and society. Um, in my own training, I, I was uh, very fortunate to have Dr. Leda Cooks, 
uh, who uh, introduced me to critical pedagogy. And she examined representations of public education through various tropes of pedagogy and power within popular media. Um, we looked at debates over high and low culture. We re-examined power and popular culture in determining taste cultures. We turned to Herbert uh, Gans and his work as a sociologist. And then we looked at the role of audiences and their abilities to decode messages uniquely and in very complicated ways, depending upon what experiences, beliefs, and values they bring to texts. So here I'm thinking of Janice Radway reading The Romance, Angela McRobbie's work in, um, on feminism and the working class and girls and girl culture, Laura Mulvey and her influential work uh, in film studies on the male gaze, Stuart Hall with encoding and decoding, and on and on we go. And then of course, what we looked at was the role of journalism at the local, national, and international level and its unique responsibilities. So um, here we turn to Ben Bagdikian and the media monopoly when he predicted that the 50 companies back, back then in the 80s uh, and into the 90s would, would whittle down to now what we have as a handful. Michael Shudson's Reading the News, um, Neil Postman and Joshua Meyerowitz, uh, Meyerowitz, whom I studied under, applying Marshall McLuhan's medium theory. And of course, Robert McChesney and um, Bill Moyers and, and folks who were part of the media reform movement. Out of all of these debates, the Action Coalition for Media um, Education emerged nearly two decades ago. And we decided to be independently funded and to focus on a term that wasn't really circulated widely then. We were not just interested in media literacy education. We put critical in front of it. Um, we wanted to emphasize approaches that engaged and challenged and created media in ways that empowered individuals and communities. So if we fast forward to today and where we are, these challenges remain. Um, and we'll be talking to you today as members of our organization about the work that we're doing. So um, I think Nolan talked about Facebook in particular. And certainly we have so many contemporary uh, um, elements that we can look at, including the investigations of the Capitol riots um, that are ongoing right now. So um, all of these issues have morphed. They look a little different now. Um, I did have some slides to share with you all, but I, I don't think I'm going to have time. So if at the end we have time, I, I can certainly go back to them. But I really appreciate um, being here today and hearing from all of you. All right, thank, thank you very much, uh, Julie. And um, I'll now uh, turn it over to Allison Butler. Hi there, thanks so much, Nolan. Um, and thank, this is, this is such a great conference. I'm so excited to be here and to be able to have this conversation. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it means to be teaching media literacy or teaching critical media literacy, particularly, um, well, sort of a little bit at the higher ed level and a little bit um, at the K through 12 level. And I'm gonna draw a little bit from what Julie talked about as when a lot of this started, it was this now, seemingly now at the time, of course it felt huge, but this seemingly now, um, almost easy mass media, right? There was almost distinct boundaries. And I think that's one of the big things that, that's changed um, since this conversation started in the US and certainly in Western Europe. Um, maybe this is a romantic revision of history, but I think maybe we used to have a bit of a handle on the media that our students used. And this feels a lot different today, right? What, what feels now as pretty clearly boundaried radio, television, film, newspapers, music, et cetera, is, is much more, um, it, it's much more diffuse and it also takes up in a, in a potentially contradictory way so much more space. Um, at the same time, there's also a greater opportunity for our students to be directly involved. As Julie talked about with so much of media production being kind of relegated to tech schools, which gave it sort of a certain reputation. What we see now for good and for ill is that so many of our students can do a level of media production um, via their phones. This is of course not a case across all of our students. It's not an entirely ubiquitous thing, but it does provide a slightly different entry point um, and a way of talking about how the media are produced, something that is so important to critical media literacy to talk about that ownership, production, and distribution. Because I think that in particular with social media can bring in a really interesting conversations. They are to some extent the producers of their media content when they're posting stuff on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or so on and so forth but they're also not because they don't own these sites and that's another thing I think that has shifted is in some ways the ownership 
of media that behind the scenes has become intentionally more mysterious, intentionally more obscure. So our students tend to be doing a fair amount of work, which is on some level entertaining and informative for them. And it is a social connection, but they're also distanced from that work in the, in the sense that they're doing the labor for these corporations without really any support from the corporations. And so kind of constructing a conversation about that relationship, they give, we all give so much of our data away without necessarily knowing where or how we're giving it. And I would reference back to Nolan's, um, um, he put in the chat the so no, information on Sophia Noble and the talking of algorithms of oppression and the way racism and sexism is built into the algorithms. And for, for many of us, we are unwitting users of that. And that's where critical media literacy absolutely is so valuable these days is being able to explore and explain some of these more mysterious or feeling more mysterious, uh, this kind of untenable, unreachable ways in which the media are coming to us and ways in which we are engaging with them. So I think in terms of teaching critical media literacy, we are, uh, we're, we're critical media literacy scholars have been talking about this for a long time. We're sort of ahead of the curve by saying, hey, we need to be looking at these, you know, forces of ownership, production and distribution and the ways in which they come to us and how they're understood. We've been doing this for a while now. So we're really well prepared, I think, to discuss some of these more difficult items. But we're also facing corporations that have taken a look around and said, I think one of two things, which is, ah, okay, this media literacy, particularly after the 2016 election with the introduction of fake news and alternative facts practically overnight becoming a ubiquitous part of our vocabulary is the corporations recognize that they might need to have, um, to get involved, right? This sort of notion of corporate bene benevolence and they make it a lot easier dreaded air quotes, in some ways, uh, to bring media literacy to classrooms and communities. And in, when I say easier, much of this stuff is free. Nolan also referenced um, a piece that we wrote on bring, in corporate media's interest in media literacy programs and developing curricula and uh, lesson plans. And for the most part, they are free of of a financial cost, but it is one, I think a way to make the corporations look good, but two, it's also absolutely unequivocally data mining, right? If, if these major corporations are at least on the surface, not allowed to collect data from miners by creating a media literacy curriculum, they have access to data from miners. And I think that that's a real risky, um, risky proposition, right? So that's a way that it's sort of changed in terms of our teaching, which is also changed in terms of what our teachers, our K through 12, as well as, as academic, you know, as well as professors are looking for. Um, we are also inundated with this media, right? This is part of how we operate. This is where we live. So much of what our teachers are looking for are ways to understand their self um, and their students. They're looking for ways to connect their students' interests with the curriculum, this is something, as Julie mentioned, that media literacy has been doing for decades now, right? So we know that that's there and that interest remains. Um, and this also brings up, of course, something that is near and dear to my professional and my personal heart is the need for teacher education, right? That we can't be asking teachers to do more despite the fact that our environment has changed we have to support them in potentially staying away from the corporate entry into media literacy, despite its ease, uh, by providing them with education as part of their graduate training, as part of their preparation to become teachers, so that it's part of, not separate from, the work that they're doing in their classroom. So thank you, Nolan. I'm going to turn it back to you for who's next. Thank you very much, Allison. Uh, next up, we have Lori bindig Usman. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. As Nolan said, I'm Lori bendig -Yusman. I'm from Sacred Heart University, which is in Fairfield, Connecticut in the US. My research focuses on the intersections of young femininity and popular culture and utilizes a critical media literacy approach. I first came to critical media literacy in the early aughts when I started to do my research and when I was in graduate school. And back then, media studies scholarship had found some things that were still 
grappling with today that, that you'll find very familiar. So they found looking at that old media that the more frequently young women read magazines, the more likely they were to diet and to feel that magazines influenced their ideal body shape. That was in 1999, Chung. Likewise, a joint Stanford and UMass study found that after only four minutes of looking at women's magazines, 70% of college women felt worse about their own looks. And that was in 1991 and 1992. In 2002, Becker and colleagues found that once American television programs, particularly Beverly Hills 90210 and Friends, that was the popular aesthetic and programming of the time, had been introduced into Fiji, which hadn't had American television prior to that, the incidence of dieting and body dissatisfaction increased. And so while the media had changed, the findings aren't all that different today. As Nolan just mentioned, the Facebook uh, whistleblower, Facebook knows that their uh, platform, Instagram, has a negative impact on the mental health of young women, making them feel worse about their bodies as well as contributing to anxiety and depression. And I believe that critical media literacy is key to intervening in this toxic media culture. Now, a critical media literacy interventions have focused on body image and eating disorders in the past, but what is problematic about that is they do this from an individualist protectionist stance. In contrast, critical media literacy can not only help young people deconstruct the images that they encounter and use media in a more thoughtful, creative way, but it can also help them question the underlying ideologies and economic imperatives driving the corporate media that surrounds them. Furthermore, critical media literacy addresses issues of power and challenges the status quo that benefits media corporations, as well as fosters empowerment and self-efficacy, which are essential for being agents of change in a functioning, functioning democracy. So my own research is, has, has drawn on implementing a critical media literacy curriculum with young women in treatment for eating disorders. And it's indebted to a number of scholars, including the critical media literacy work of Kellner, as well as Lewis and Jolly, critical pedagogy work of Freire, Shore, and Bergsma, and earlier critical media literacy, eating disorder prevention and body image work of Levine and Smolik, O'Day and Davidson and Wade, and the feminist work of, of Niva Perrin. My own research found that critical media literacy not only increased those uh, understanding of media literacy that the tenants that Oster Hyde wrote about, but also increased their sense of empowerment and then decreased their drive for thinness. Furthermore, critical media literacy provided a platform for these young women to connect with each other about media, something that they struggled with all the time, something that they were interacting with all the time, but did not have an opportunity to discuss in meaningful ways elsewhere. It provided them the tools to analyze media and respond to media triggers. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, it gave them an opportunity to engage in activism. They were able to call out what we would say now, calling out perpetrators of toxic media culture in a letter writing campaign. Given this population's tendency, and by this population, I mean young women in treatment for eating disorders, their tendency to resist treatment in general, the fact that they reported critical media literacy is both valuable and enjoyable is particularly noteworthy. So, to bring this all together, I would say that critical media literacy is now more essential than ever. Not only can it provide invaluable tools that could be made easily accessible, as I think about women in treatment with eating disorders or anyone seeking healthcare, it's often inaccessible due to systemic race and class uh, issues. But critical media literacy can also challenge the ideologies and policies that benefit a white, supremacist, capitalist, heteronormative patriarchy 
that benefits at the cost of everyone else. So I'll leave it there right for right now, and I'm happy to take any questions later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, next, we have um, Kendra Hodgson. You're up next. Great. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here with you all. Um, 20 years ago, I was teaching high school media literacy, and now I am um, now I'm a parent, a mom of teenagers. So I think it's really interesting to look at what was I teaching 20 years ago and, and now what am I teaching now to my own children and, and how does that ecosystem shift and, and everything that Julie and, um, and oh, I saw Lori's cat, <laughs> uh, Julie, Julie and Lori and Allison said uh, resonates so deeply. Um, back when I was teaching media literacy to high school students in the late 90s, early 2000s, we spent time flipping through magazines, pulling out print advertisements, and looking at representation, camera angles, and messaging. So that's the, the kind of, you know, the, the representation analysis piece that, that, that was being spoken about. We looked at television commercials and discussed product placement in movies. But we are always looking at those patterns of representation um, and how they were driven by the larger commercial media ownership. Um, that was always a question. And I think it was, Allison mentioned the, the boundaries of the media system. So at that time, we could, it was possible to look at that and say, well, there's only five or six corporations, depending on which year we were in. Um, uh, and, and how does that then influence the pattern of representation because they were being constructed and fed to us at that point. But over the past 20 years, as everybody's spoken about, we've seen the explosion of the inter internet. Television's moved online. So people are now watching shows on demand. Um, most teenagers have smartphones. It's pretty hard to fight for very long. Uh, so they're constantly on screens and using media. And we, uh, we have social media as a factor of daily teen life. Um, back um, with my own kids and, and their friends, they believe, as, and in a way this is true, I think Allison addressed this, that they're constructing many of the images that they now are consuming. And, and they are, they are actually physically constructing those. But Lori mentioned the images of women. Um, and I think what, it, what is so interesting watching my kids, they're replicating the commercially constructed images. So while they are, while they are <laughs> like literally constructing these images, their minds are also still being influenced by this pattern that is corporate controlled. And um, that is a much trickier thing to teach. Um, I'm not doing it in the classroom right now, but it is very difficult for me to help my children understand that these images that they're putting out have, have been influenced by a commercial system and an ecosystem. Um, and, and that I think is super important to our certain, our, our point in time in, in this moment of critical media literacy um, is that, is to, to acknowledge the agency, but to also look at that larger corporate control. Um, Another thing that, uh, that I think is, has changed significantly is that, that algorithms keep all of us, teens and adults alike, in our own siloed echo chambers on social media and online. And Allison touched on this briefly about how we used to know what everybody was watching because it was all pretty much the same. Now we got siloed. So if you, watch a certain kind of TikTok video, you get fed more TikTok videos that look just like that. And you don't just get the TikTok videos that look like that. That's also the kind of things that you're gonna get on Google. That's also what you're gonna see on any other platform you go to so that the same, you get the, what's the echo chamber, right? You just keep getting the same messaging over and over and over. Um, so then my teens, my kids come to me and as though that is the way the world works. And, and it's very difficult to then say, well, here's another perspective. Like, that's not what you're hearing online, uh, but here's another piece because this is another echo chamber. <laughs> and, and I think that is something 
that the corporations are absolutely a part of because the algorithms are getting written by these big tech companies and, and the coding is, is, is made to bring in input of data and then output exactly, you know, something that's based on what got input. And I think that is another place we need to really help young people understand the connection between corporate control of creation of the algorithms and, and how it is um, feeding what they're seeing online and, and not just the images, but the, the messages and, and the, the kind of political ideology that is being served to them and perpetuated. Um, it's a pretty high level conversation to have with teenagers. I am trying desperately <laughs> so that, that they, they, my kids can get that um, and, and feeding it in little pieces. And I think this is everything, like this is teaching. When you're teaching young people, they don't have to, un you need to understand the whole piece. And then you need to figure out how to feed them breadcrumbs so that they get the piece as they go along. Um, I think this point of algorithmic, I'm calling it algorithmic liter literacy. I think this is the, the present of, of media literacy. And I think it's the future. I think this is where we really need to be focusing so much because it is going to drive the different kinds of representations we're gonna see going forward. It's gonna drive the, rep, the, the messaging. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now, but that, that's kind of where I feel like we've come, we've come from and where we are right now. So thank you so much and I'll hand it back to Nolan. Thank you very much, Kendra. And remind everyone, if they have um, questions they want me to ask the panelists afterwards, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I'll now turn it over to Gordon Glover. Oh, hi. Um, I wasn't sure if I was on. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, terrific. Thanks. Um, it's really great to be here. I'm Gordon Glover. I teach creative media in uh, Burlington, Vermont. So I'm, I'm teaching sort of an arts, technology and arts program. And I'm currently not uh, teaching courses in media studies or media literacy, but I kind of think of what I do as, as uh, infusing that into all my courses anyway. Um, it's great to be a part of this conversation. I think in listening to everyone else's remarks, it occurs to me that I'm going to kind of jump to the, the closer, what I, was going to, what I was going to say near the end and put it right at the beginning. And that is, um, I had a colleague who a couple of weeks ago, welcoming students back to campus where I'm at, um, used the framing idea of the word antediluvian, meaning sort of after the flood. And his point was that, um, we've all been kind of discussing this idea of back to normal and that that we're not ever going back to normal after um, the last 18 months, two years of pandemic. And in welcoming students back, you know, he just said, we are, this is a new, we are in a new place. This is after the, after the flood. Um, when I think about this, it reminds me a lot of you know, the months and, and, and years after 9-11 where a lot of us were just like, how, what does this mean for the world? How are we ever gonna level out and return to a, you know, normal in quotes way of functioning? And um, I mean, I'm really excited to listen to my colleagues and, and it's, we are all jumping right back into uh, the history and our, and our ideas about pedagogy, but there's sort of an elephant in the room, I think that this pandemic and being isolated and going online for 18 months is, is a flood. It is, it is an event that I think we all know what, what are our students and what's our culture gonna be like a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now. Um, there is a paradigm shift that we've all been talking about and studying for the past 10 years. Um, this has been sort of a, a turbocharge of the paradigm shift. Um, let me just say that almost two years ago to the day I did a you know, pre-flood um, I was at a conference talking about um, my sort of anecdotal research and documentary research with the idea of device policies in classrooms. You know, I had gone from talking with my colleagues about, um, do you have a problem with devices in your classroom, students having phones and laptops? And I, I went from it not really being a problem or, or even something I noticed 
to very quickly being something that needed to be addressed very overtly. Um, within uh, the space of about two years, I went from not noticing to having to, like students not being able to stay off of their devices. Like if I had a device policy that said no phones, they, they were not able to do that. Um, so this was just months before pandemic lockdown. I was pretty deeply engaged in this conversation with peers and colleagues and, and looking at research about this, about device use and its effects and, and how it was just basically flooding, to use that, to stick with that metaphor, flooding into my, my space and my classroom and my, 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 you know, my students' lives and my life. And um, flash forward to now, um, you know, pandemic caused it from, to, to even talk about device policy right now, returning to campus seems preposterous because we went from devices being sort of maybe a problematic element in the classroom to the, the classroom being completely on the device, like completely on the device for three semesters. Um, and so I, that, that's, where, that's where my, um, my, my research, my practice is, is, is stuck looking in this, this mirror of uh, maybe an idea of antediluvian, like now, what happens now? And, um, and what, what are the implications going to be moving forward? And to continue to use, you know, with the framing of this whole conversation we're having now about uh, is critical media literacy, you know, more relevant than ever. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it's, um, it was always relevant, but now it's, it's crucial and essential because of, of the things I've just described. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Bill Usman, who's going to uh, complete our introductory remarks. Bill. Thank you, Nolan. Um, it's a real honor to be able to present at such a great and important conference. So kudos to all of you and thank, uh, thank you to, to everyone who's here right now. Um, in keeping with the theme of, of this panel, I want to spend just a little bit of time looking back in order to figure out where we are and maybe make some suggestions about uh, where we should be going. A decade ago, um, the scholar Bell Hooks reflected on her early education as a child. And she wrote, to my, to my teachers, she had a really good educational experience, unlike what so many of us have. Um, she said, to my teachers, a good education was not just one that would give us knowledge and prepare us for a vocation. It was also an education that would encourage an ongoing commitment to social justice, particularly to the struggle for racial equality. <clears throat> then um, about um, two decades ago, uh, in a piece that Julie alluded to, um, Jolly and Lewis wrote, the argument we wish to make is in essence a simple one. Media literacy should be about helping people to become sophisticated citizens rather than sophisticated consumers. The mass media, in other words, should be understood as more than a collection of texts to be deconstructed so that we can choose among them. They should be analyzed as a set of institutions with particular social and economic structures that are neither inevitable nor irreversible. Media education should certainly teach students to engage media texts, but it should also, in our view, teach them to engage and challenge media institutions. This sort of approach is, I agree with Gordon, even more relevant in the age of smartphones and social media and ubiquitous production and consumption of media. So very briefly, I want to argue that the best way for media to literacy to move forward over the coming decades when it seems obvious that the world is facing what Gramscian scholars would call a moment of conjuncture uh, brought upon by multiple crises is by either rediscovering or uh, for, for, for others discovering for the first time, the heart of critical media literacy in an approach informed by the legacy of cultural studies. Um, Henry Jenkins said that one could argue that cultural studies is the theory, media literacy is the practice. And um, 
you know, just just a side note about this idea of a conjuncture. Uh, Stuart, Stuart Hall said that a conjuncture is a strikingly condensed and contradictory moment of political struggle, victory, defeat, and transformation. Robert Carley said conjunctures represent political opportunities that emerge out of short-term circumstantial responses to social problems, opportunities for groups to raise consciousness, organize, mobilize, and combine. The conditions through which it becomes more than merely possible, but rather necessary to begin to think otherwise about the world. That sure seems like an accurate description of the moment that we're in. So if this is indeed a critical conjuncture, that requires a certain amount of courage on the part of media literacy scholars and educators and activists and artists, because as Stuart Hall wrote, cultural change has to be reckoned within the dirty outside world. That's his beautiful phrase. And I take this to be Hall's acknowledgement that academic work means nothing if it doesn't engage with the political struggles that we all have to face as we negotiate worlds of abusive power, inequality, injustice, environmental destruction. How can we talk about news media without talking about democracy and social justice? How can we be satisfied with sophisticated deconstructions of advertising that don't engage with the role that consumer culture has played in creating economic inequality, mental distress, and environmental degradation. Hall described the mission of cultural studies very succinctly when he wrote, to enable people to understand what is going on and especially to provide ways of thinking, strategies for survival, and resources for resistance. Not just analysis, resistance. And this is the path I would educate, I, I, I would advocate for, for media education to move forward into a harrowing 21st century. Douglas Kellner has long made the connections between cultural studies and critical media literacy explicit. Um, and he argues that cultural studies is not just another academic fad, but can be part of a struggle for a better society and a better life. From that perspective, I, I would agree with the other panelists, we need it now more than ever. So I wanna conclude, um, in the current moment with some words just from uh, the scholar Deepa Kumar and her new book, which is a new edition of her book, um, Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire, that she's now calling 20 years after 9-11. And she writes, and I'll finish with this, this is an era, this is an era of victories, but also defeats of highs and lows of revolutions and counter-revolutions. What is undeniable is the desire for change. What this brings is the potential to create a brand new world of race, free of racism and imperialism. A new world where every individual will be treated with respect. Dr. Kumar, let it be so. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, all the panelists. Very good. Thank you all for your remarks. Um, we do have some, we have about 15 minutes. We do have some um, remarks and questions. Um, James uh, noted an issue he's having. I think it'd be good to hear uh, some folks comment on it. He said, uh, James says, he teaches a critical news and info course, but does not call it critical because it turns off the very students who need this kind of pedagogy. Any perspective or uh, advice for James? Nolan, I'd love to, to take that a little bit on. I, I totally get that. I actually wrote that in my notes when I saw that come up in the chat, because I do think that is a, a continuous struggle. Um, I think that there is this perspective out there that critical automatically equals negative. And I think one of the things that critical media literacy scholars can bring to the conversation is that critical doesn't have to be negative, 
right? That that critical is actually can be a distance. It's it's about you know if we are so emotionally invested in our position or our texts or our music or whatever, to be critical is to take a couple steps back from that. It's not to say you're not allowed to be on social media because it's evil. It's how about a better understanding, a more multi-dimensional understanding of what social media, which I realize is a huge term, like it needs to be broken down further and further and further than that. But I always try and introduce critical as not dislike and not us, the instructors or us, the scholars or us, the whatever, trying to take away your fun because I would be hugely hypocritical, right? I would be an absolute hypocrite if I did that because I, I will go home this evening and be watching TV and probably loving it and then probably falling asleep on the couch because, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age on a Sunday night. <laughs> uh, but to be critical is to say, we're going to look at this as a multidimensional text and see it and ask questions about it, get to know it better from a variety of different angles. So I, I absolutely get it. Using the word critical can be kind of a rough, it can be a, a, an anxiety producing entry. But I think if we can kind of do that reminder of saying it doesn't automatically equal dislike, it's about getting to know ourselves, our texts, our choices that much more thoroughly it can actually be a, a friendly thing. And if I can just jump on what Allison was saying, um, we can't live outside of culture, right? All of us are part of this culture, even if we all are siloed, as Kendra said. And so again, it, admitting to students, like Allison was saying, that, that we're part of this too. We're not saying that you need to turn it off. And then sometimes you get, the folks that are like, oh, well, I don't watch TV or I don't, I, I believe we talked about this at the very opening session, there were comments about that. Well, you're still part of this culture. So even if you don't watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians, you still know who they are. Good. Okay, good. We have a question from uh, Magda Martinez says, uh, this topic of CML is very interesting uh, because that is the question, 20 years of CML and why this topic is relevant now with the pandemic. Um, our students and teenagers are engaged more than ever before in the mass media and social media. At the same time, my question is, how popular does culture, how does popular culture affect their cultural identity um, because they consume and produce culture every day? Who wants to take that one? Lori? Sorry, if I'm talking too much. Um, so I am an admitted pop culture junkie. My uh, research besides my critical media literacy research is I, I write about teen TV shows. So Dawson's Creek, Gossip Girl, The O.C., Crazy Riverdale and Pretty Little Liars, um, all these, these shows. And my own research from looking at audience analysis is not just that these shows are wildly popular and um, young people as well as uh, adults who watch these shows spend lots of time engaging in online talking about them. But in particular, they shape their buying habits, they shape their appearances on these, uh, on these shows that, um, and, and the companies know that they're doing it. Back uh, in the, early um, 2000s, late 90s, the WB knew what they were doing with product placement and forging synergistic uh, relationships between Dawson's Creek and, and the clothing retailer American Eagle because to, the, the people who were watching the show would go out and buy the products because they wanted to look like their char favorite characters. If we jump to Pretty Little Liars, um, ABC Family, now Freeform, built this new network and following by getting the stars on social media and having uh, the audience follow them and follow their Instagram accounts because they wanted to be friends or emulate the stars who were living these seemingly glamorous, though we know, perfectly curated lives and will buy 
whatever products that they're selling, whether explicitly or trying to emulate it in appearance and, and behavior. Um, and when there are really dangerous ideologies being promoted in the show, I think of something like uh, Gossip Girls, whose very first episode is deals with multiple sexual assaults, audience members will contort themselves to try to justify those characters' actions um, because they like the character. And that perpetuates a, a very dangerous rape culture, a toxic culture. So these have political implications as well that, that, that uh, other uh, scholars have found that young people do know, um, B. Graham McKinley in particular, knows that young people used to have some distance and now um, are just embracing these ideologies and the content of popular culture. And this is just a small segment of popular culture, but I think it speaks to a wider uh, popular culture as well. Thank you. Can I, can I just add to what Lori said and kind of encapsulate um, some of the earlier questions about like the critical turning students off. There's no doubt that pedagogically how we approach these topics um, matters. And I've, I've shifted in teaching media criticism, I've shifted my entire syllabus. I used to start with pretty heavy hitting topics on political economy, institutional analysis. And I found that students then started to be disengaged. And I think Lori's approach, it harkens back more to the, the folks that said, bring popular culture into the classroom and ask students to analyze their own interactions with media. But then you slowly work at, at um, providing these critical media liter literacy skills by showing the interrelationships between narrative structures. So what is the story about that, that we're engaged with, right? And that can be across all sorts of forms, you know, even music being very popular among youths. But then we slowly start looking at who's producing these and then the relationships between the narrative structures, the types of themes and stories we see as they then perpetuate things. We look at larger social structures of racism, sexism, classism, and so forth. And through that intersectionality of analysis, then we talk about corporate media, political economy, the institutions and how they're structured. And then we look at things that, at target audiences and marketing, right? Like Lori's saying, you know, what are the practices of trying to disseminate these things and look at new platforms and new means of distribution that oftentimes, as Allison said, really um, involve us. And it feels participatory on the one hand in a Henry Jenkins kind of, you know, hop on pop way. On the other hand, it's a form of what I explained to the students is we're, if you take a Marxist approach, it's play labor. It seems like fun, but we're producing labor much in the same way that Lacan talked about jouissance and plaisir, right? That, that uh, plaisir and, and those kinds of aspects, they're fun on the one hand, but they're embedded within very capitalistic and patriarchal structures um, and very racist structures that we need to analyze carefully. So I do agree that how we approach these things pedagogically matters. And oftentimes if I start more with students doing a media diet and media analysis, and then slowly working these themes in and, and then at the end saying, now you analyze something you care about. And if you love it, make it better. And I explained to them, the analogy is just like your coaches, your educators, your parents, they, when they really love you, they're gonna call you out on things they know you could do better. And that's the approach we need to have with our students when they engage in media is say, you don't have to hate it. If you love it, make it better and then produce your own, come up with an alternative. Thank you. Um, there's also some great stuff going on in the, in the chat. Um, Kendra is providing some great resources for folks who are wondering about um, disrupting algorithms. Uh, I, I want to jump to a question from um, Allison Trope. Uh, and Allison talks about um, personal struggles in the classroom with potentially traumatizing students when showing media to deconstruct specifically around race and gender. And um, the question is, how do we adequately contextualize for a mixed audience, some of whom may be very familiar and potentially traumatized with by particular representations and others who may, who may need a more basic introduction? And Allison um, mentioned specifically, this may speak to Allison Butler's teacher training, but I don't know if anybody wants to take that one. I mean, I would I would sort of reference back a little bit to what Julie said about changing her course syllabus and the order in which she did things is start off with something that might be perceived a shared perception of being quote unquote easier, right? Not not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also about trust building, right? I mean, if we're asking our students or we're asking teachers in a teacher training program to do that level of self-reflective work, 
um, I think we have to do it too, right? There has to be some degree of breaking that, you know, sage on the stage, teacher student thing. Like, I mean, that's work that media literacy has been doing since the beginning is it's it's a shared conversation. It's also a shared conversation that that makes explicitly aware the hierarchy, right? I mean, as the instructor, I'm the one who's going to be providing a grade for this that does on some level give me greater power. Um, but to be explicit about that. So I would say sort of start with topics where we can kind of start to build trust, you know, build a working relationship with each other, build that opportunity to say, okay, how can, can we move this? Is this, is this good? Is this going to be productive to move this into more difficult topics? I'll also spend some time talking about how talking about difficult topics is like really taking it up a couple of like, you know, talking yeah. about talking about something. It's, I don't want to get overly bureaucratic, but the way of saying that talking about and working with difficult topics is incredibly important, but sort of easing into it so that it's not this, you know, diving in at the deep end right away, which can be completely overwhelming, but saying that like, here's a, here's something we're going to get to, or here's a way, you know, a, a, the way that we can take this conversation further. Here's how to address things that are uh, challenging. But once we get to a point where there's trust, it's going to make it less difficult, right? And as, you know, Gordon talking about the sort of elephant in the room of the pandemic, I don't think anybody was happy in March of 2020. Like it was nobody's best March ever. But the one thing that I felt when I left campus was I feel like I have a really good relationship with my class. I can make, I feel less nervous, still nervous, but less nervous about making this transition because we already have an established relationship, right? And so kind of trying to build that because that's the work of media literacy. We should be modeling and wor working, you know, walking the talk as it were of media literacy all the time. Um, and that's one thing that I try and sort of make explicit in my classes too, is by the way, this is why I'm doing this. By the way, this is why I'm using these words. This is why we're doing this in this order because this is walking the talk of media literacy and trying to do all of that transparent work of being explicit about what we're doing. Yeah, and 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 if I could just jump in, I want to I want to sign off on everything that Allison just said, uh, and the stuff that Julie said about you know easing in, easing in, you know, let's not hit them with the worst stuff at the very first class, um, and also you know the meta stuff that that Allison mentioned. I think that's so important. So as an example. Um, I do believe that if we're thinking about this as transformative education in a Frarian sense, there are going to be moments of discomfort. Uh, no one has ever come to a new way of looking at the world without feeling uncomfortable, without feeling shaken by that. But that's okay. But, um, you know, to, to be very reflective about that and to be, be very explicitly uh, dialogic about that. So, so as a brief example, um, in, in one class that I teach, I have the students watch the film American History X, which includes some really, really brutal scenes of white supremacist violence. Um, I don't just throw it at them. We don't just like kind of just like start watching it. We have discussions about what it is that we're gonna be dealing with, why it's important to deal with, how it might make people feel, an open space to talk about that. Um, and, you know, and then there, I don't believe in always giving students the right to opt out of content, but if for an individual student, there's a particular individual reason that they can, you know, have something alternative, making that be okay as well. So, you know, a tremendous amount of dialogue, a tremendous amount of flexibility, and a tremendous amount of listening um, both ways. Excellent, thank you uh, very much. We have um, so many questions and comments and we only have a minute left and um, I wanna make sure um, we spend that minute just thanking all of you for, for showing up and, and bringing your comments and questions. And then of course, um, give some reactions, give some love to the uh, panelists up here um, for turning out and doing this today. 
and I do hope you join us. Uh, we put uh, somewhere buried in this wonderful <laughs> chat um, is the Action Coalition um, website. And we did recently, uh, thanks to Gordon, uh, we now have a new site uh, as well, acmecriticalmedia.com that you can go to as well, and it'll bring you to the site. Did I say it right, Gordon? Yes. <laughs> so we're, we're a network and we've worked with Project Censored before and we've helped to co-sponsor this conference and others. So we'd, we'd love to have um, you as part of our team so we can share our, our networks and our, our good work that we're doing on this front. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If it's possible to transcribe the chat, I don't know, sometimes when you turn it off, it vaporizes. So if somebody could copy paste it, it might be cool to mine the links. I was just thinking that too, Gordon. It's such great um, resources too. Yeah, and there was a yeah, question through timing. It's understandable. 